excited to have Deborah Dyson back with us. Um, she's actually done this presentation a couple of times, but we always have new folks coming into the building and around the Capitol complex. And so um, I'm very happy that she agreed to come back and talk with us about um, local government law. Uh, Deborah is a legislative analyst with the House Research Department. And if you are not familiar with the House Research Department, they are amazing. Um, they do fantastic publications that are very well sourced, very well researched. So I encourage you to check out their website if you have not before. Um, Deborah has her earned her JD from the University of Minnesota and her bachelor's degree from Carleton College in Northfield. Please help me welcome Deborah. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, thanks for coming. Um, and I have to say before, sorry, I understand this is a webinar, so people will be listening remotely and they'll be sending in questions remotely. But um, I also know that there's a former colleague who lives in Colorado now who told me she'd be listening. So I'm going to say, hi, Becky. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, in, in the one hour, what I'm going to try and cover uh, local government powers generally, there's uh, the issue of state and local relations. That I want to cover special legislation, which is a constitutional issue, and the local approval provisions that um, go with that, and then some county, city, town structures, population issues. Starting with the state and local relations, uh, the first thing I want to talk about is Dylan's rule. And Dylan's, um, Dylan's rule um, is it's called that because it's named after an Iowa Supreme Court justice. Uh, John Dillon, who in the 1870s wrote a treatise on local government law. The rule is that local governments possess only the powers that are conferred by statute or implied as necessary to carry out legislatively conferred powers. So I often get the question from uh, people, you know, where does it say that a local, that the city cannot do this? And the starting point of any question with local government in Minnesota, keep in mind this is Minnesota's uh, rule, is where is the power to do it? It's a, a grant of authority, not a prohibition. Now, there are laws that prohibit local governments from doing certain things, but um, the starting point always is to look for where is the authority to do it, or is it necessarily implied? Um, other states have a different starting point, and that's why I wanted to emphasize Minnesota, because um, I think, as I've been told, I'm not, I don't know much about other states, to be honest, but there's something called a Cooley Doctrine, and I was told it came out of Michigan in the 1870s, and there the premise is local governments have inherent powers, and there it's sort of the opposite of how Minnesota handles this. One of the, this is a pretty severe rule, if you think about it, that um, you have to go find the statute that says a local government can do something. There are two things that mitigate the severity of that. One is the, um, here, I have to point this correctly, oops, back, home rule, did I do this right? Home rule charters. Uh, the Constitution in Minnesota authorizes uh, the legislature to provide for home rule charters and charter commissions. And the uh, in state statute, Minnesota has provided for cities to adopt home rule charters. There's no general law for counties or other forms of government to adopt home rule charters, but cities can. And then, um, but there is one special law that was enacted in the 1980s, a 1987 special law for Ramsey County, and they set up a, a charter commission for Ramsey County. And in 1990, the voters adopted the charter that, and it became effective in 92. So there's one home rule charter county in Minnesota and then uh, cities, 107 of the 853 cities in Minnesota are home rule charter. And one of the things you want to look at with um, a charter is that uh, it's like a miniature constitution for the, the city. Uh, the, and that, again, this, everything from my point of view on how I look at local government, it has to do with how it, what I'm doing in my job, which is drafting legislation so uh, to change laws. So I'm always sort of looking at it from that point of view. But if you are working in the courts or as a practitioner representing um, clients, you also want to be thinking about where is the authority come from. And so um, even though I'm talking about it as a drafting matter, um, it works out uh, as an important point to look at uh, from any perspective. So you get a question from a about a city. 
one of the things you want to know is, is the city a home rule charter city? What does the charter say? How does it relate to state statutes? Is it a statutory city? And then what are the statutes providing and how have the courts interpreted the uh, statutes? One of the things to keep in mind for home rule charter cities is that they typically um, have, there's that statute that I said at the bottom of the slide, 410 point, um, maybe it's not on the slide, but uh, 410.33, I think, says that a home rule charter city can use any power granted to a statutory city unless the charter prohibits it. So um, there's, that's another point to keep in mind. Um, why would a city go with home rule charter? Well, one of the things they can do that statutory cities cannot is have an initiative and referendum. Uh, recall um, election by board. Well, go back to there. Go back to every now and then it seems to pop there. Okay. Uh, so now I'll go to the next. The other thing that the other uh, thing that would mitigate the severity of the of the um, Dillon's rule in Minnesota is the authority for local governments to exercise. Uh, power to protect uh, protect the general health, safety, and welfare of their mm -hmm. residents. Statutory cities have an express uh, general welfare authority in statute. Home rule charter cities can do it through their charter or by application of the statute that I mentioned that said that home rule charter cities can use authority of statutory cities unless the charter prohibits it. Towns have similar authority. And then counties, it's really kind of limited. They don't have general welfare authority, but there is a public health statute that they have um, used to enact ordinances to protect the health of their uh, residents. But it is much more limited. It's basically, uh, general welfare is typically for towns and cities. So um, going on to the next big topic that I wanted to talk about uh, today, and this is one that comes up a lot, has to do with special legislation. Article 12 of the Constitution, uh, Minnesota, gover uh, Minnesota Constitution governs special legislation for local government. And what I want to talk about is what is that, what is it, uh, what is classification and the judicial review of special legislation, some interesting history about it, and then um, topics relating to local approval, what the statutes and drafting uh, recommendations are. Um, I have some cautionary tales about things that have gone wrong. And then how do you research local laws um, and some resources? So first, what is it? Uh, special legislation is legislation that applies to part of a class, a particular person, thing, or locale within a given class. The most common examples um, are ones that apply to individual units of government, uh, special tax increment financing laws, um, liquor laws for units of government. Um, we have a whole lot of them that have come through uh, the legislature in the past for counties, allowing individual counties to appoint certain row officers, the auditor, treasurer, recorder, instead of using the statute that requires a referendum. And they might come in and get a special law for that. And, um, most uh, special laws for local governments are not coded, so they're not going to be found in the statutes. They're in the session laws, but some have been codified, uh, particularly the, the laws for Hennepin, Ramsey, Dakota, St. Louis County, Anoka County. They have, um, for some reason, been put into statute, and um, there's always a debate about what gets codified and what doesn't. So what does the special legislation um, provision prohibit? If a general law can be enacted, the legislature may not enact a special law except the local law. And then there's uh, a list. So one of the things that in drafting or in doing research, what you want to be thinking about is, could a general law have been enacted? And every now and then there's something where you really can't do a general law to address a topic, but local law, um, is allowed, and the Constitution also lists certain subjects in which the legislature cannot enact even a local law. And there's, um, in Article 12, Section 1, the list includes things like laying out, opening, altering, vacating, and maintaining roads, highways, streets, alleys, remitting fines, penalties, or forfeitures, 
changing the names of persons, places, lakes, or rivers, authorizing the adoption or legitimation of children, changing the law of descent or succession, conferring rights on minors, declaring a person um, of age, giving effect to informal, informal or invalid wills or deeds, um, and it kind of goes on, granting divorces, uh, exempting property from taxation, regulating the rate of interest on money, creating private corporations, and uh, there's some others in there. Some examples of, um, just a second. Some examples of uh, some special laws there's a, that have been, um, where um, actually my notes here have gotten mixed up here, but what I will do, <laughs> so excuse me. The, um, I, one of the things I wanted, I will be pointing you to is the revisor's drafting manual, but there are a number of examples in the drafting manual yeah. of uh, special laws that have been challenged in court and held invalid, and then, and why, and then there's some examples uh, where they've been upheld, and it all relates to classification, and uh, so um, the, classification is going to be an important part of this. One of the things that did come up a few years ago in um, the committee that I staff was a law to change the name of a town from Lake Edwards to Lake Edward. And it's a very simple change, but um, it, I was pointing out to them that uh, the author of the bill that that's contrary to the constitution that says that you, can't have a, you cannot have a special law changing the name of a place individually. So it was modified to give the county authority to do it and uh, by following uh, some procedures that are in statute. One of the questions that always comes up though is if the legislature really wants to do it, they will enact something even if you might say that doesn't look right under the constitution, then you always have to ask yourself who will challenge it, is it and what would happen. And if you're practicing, that's one of the things you want to be looking at. You know, what's, how does it fit in there? Is it important to challenge or not? Classification. Classification and judicial standard of view, review. Um, a law is general if it applies to all of a class. And it's okay if it applies to all similarly situated um, under the classification, that the distinctions that are made are not manifestly arbitrary, but they're genuine and substantial, providing a natural and reasonable basis, justifying the distinction. And evident, there's an evident connection between the distinctive needs peculiar to the class and the law. One of the things that, um, if you go through cases that are looking at the challenge of the classification I always come to the conclusion it's kind of a case-by-case -case analysis, as often the case, but then it's also, is the class open? So if the classification sort of meets these criteria but and is also open so that in the future, it's possible that someone else could join that class, the court is more likely to say it's okay um, than if it's completely closed off. And completely closed off, you get cases where, you know, this law applies in a county with a population between 10,005 and 10,500 with, you know, this, a city of this size, you know, it's, it's like, it's really narrow. If it gets challenged, that would be one of the arguments to make that, you know, that's, it's just not open for uh, future uh, members of the class. But a classification of one is permissible. And there are cases out there that say, this is a classification of one and that's okay. Uh, there was one a number of years ago uh, with DNR and the sale of, of some land in Bayport. And the court said, yeah, this is a classification of one and that's okay. So I always come back to case by case analysis, try and parse it out. And as a drafting matter, it's always a question of, does it really need to be stated as a classification as opposed to a local law? And I think in some drafting areas, it's become a, more of a habit to or tradition in, a, in certain bills to say, we draft these as classifications as opposed to just naming the units of government and allowing it to be a local law. And uh, I think if it can be just named and treated as a local law as opposed to a classification, it's um, more straightforward. People know what's going on 
and is less likely to be challenged. The um, courts have said that whether a law could, uh, general law could have been made um, applicable in any case is a judicial determination, and they don't really care what the legislature says about it. Classes. Uh, the whole issue of classification, uh, it started, well, I'll get into the history in a second. The classifications, first of all, powers are granted to certain classes of cities. And uh, when Rochester, right now, they're, the classifications are for cities are strictly population-based. So you have first class over 100,000 population, second between 20,001 and 100, third class 10 to 20, and fourth class is under 10,000. The um, and these are set in statute. At one time, they were in the Constitution. There it goes again. Okay. Oh, it's back. Um, and one of the reasons for classification uh, is that general. Okay. I'm I'm not sure what's going on with this. <laughs> there we go. Um, that one. <laughs> There we go, history. Um, classification. Um, this was one thing that I found interesting when I first started doing local government law, which is just almost 20 years ago. The, um, in 1857, the only thing that was in the Constitution was that the legislature could not grant divorces or create corporations other than for uh, local government. By 1881, special laws on 11 topics were added. Um, to the Constitution by amendment, and um, then in 1882, uh, it was amended, 92, it was amended again, um, and there has been a lot of litigation over it. The 1892 amendment also prohibited local laws. So from 1892 until the Constitution was amended in 58, local laws were, uh, were not allowed, and that's where classification got used a lot to identify uh, certain units of government and um, avoid having it as a special law. One of the things that I, um, I have a, on the House Research website, there's a publication called Special Legislation, but when I was doing research on this a long time ago, I was looking at special laws that were showing up in the 1800s and before the prohibition on special law was enacted, the volume of special laws was had, you know, 350 laws, special laws, where the general laws were like 200. So there were always many more special laws, and some of them were as tiny as changing the name of a church in a small town, and it would be by special law. And that's one of the reasons that led to the amendment to the Constitution to prohibit them. But the uh, severity of that prohibiting local law became more and more difficult, which is to deal with with local governments uh, wanted special law or the legislature wanted them to have certain laws applied to them. So the 1958 amendment opened it up, but there's still, uh, you'll, that creates certain problems in researching local laws. Um, and I have an example later for the city of Hibbing that shows um, how that has changed. Um, so continuing with the history on this a little bit, um, the special laws relating to local government, uh, they take effect only if the local government approves this, approves the law, and there's provisions in statute that relate to the local approval. One of the reasons for this is to uh, prevent the legislature from coming in and changing something contrary to the wishes of the residents of that unit of government. But it does have that phrase, unless otherwise provided by general law. And there are some exceptions to the local approval requirement. And for a couple of years, um, in the 60s, there was uh, no local approval required. So there was a little bit of a glitch in there for a while. From, that was my next slide, local approval from 58 to 67, uh, local approval was just required from 67 to 79. It was longer than ago. No local approval was required. And in 1979, the statute went back to uh, and requires local approval with some exceptions. And 
the um, I give you the statutes for the local approval statutes. 645.021 is the general one, and that just lays out that um, the local approval consists of the local governing body adopting resolution unless the legislation says you have to do it by popular vote um, in the city. You can do it either way, but the default is resolution of the governing body that states you know, what the law, states the facts of the matter, attaches it to a certificate that is prepared by the Attorney General's office, and uh, then you file the certificate and the resolution with the Secretary of State. And it has to be done before the beginning of the next biennium, so before the beginning of a uh, session that begins in the odd-numbered year. 645.023 are the exceptions, and the primary exception, um, well, there's several. One is that is used often is that if the law is permissive, you don't have to do local approval. You can say, this city may do that, and then you can let it go. And it makes sense. Um, if it's permissive, they don't have to do it. Why would you require them to do local approval? Well, there are some reasons why you might, but, um, and I'll, uh, primarily to cut off the amount of time. If you're giving them some authority, if they want to do it and you want to cut off how much time they have to decide whether or not they're going to do it, you'd use a local approval provision to say, you have until the beginning of the next biennium to make up your mind. Then um, the uh, another exception is it's no local approval required if it's over 1 million in population. And that was primarily for the creation of uh, the Metropolitan Council in 1967 and just saying, you know, you've got over a million population for this political subdivision. You do not need local approval. Um, it now applies to Hennepin County. Hennepin County is now a population, um, as of the last census, over one million, and the legislature can require Hennepin County to do things without being subject to local approval. Another exception is repeal of a special law to bring the local unit of government into conformance with general law. The uh, 645.024 is... Um, I've forgotten what that one covers. It, oh, it just says um, where you're where you've applied uh, local approval, even if it's um, an exception applies. If you make it subject to local approval, it is. And then um, the effective date it has to be stated. So it might be the day after they filed. It might be uh, later if that's what you put in the law. Drafting local approval, this is from the revisor's drafting manual, but this is sort of the most comprehensive, and it was developed to try and put local governments on notice of what they need to do. Um, and the, it's the governing body and the chief of, chief of clerical officer, so the city council and then the city clerk, timely complete. That's to put them on notice that there's a time frame in which they have to do this. And then you, the citation to both subdivisions, both the resolution adopting and the filing with the Secretary of State. There are different ways to draft these. You'll see them drafted all different ways, but um, one thing to, that I like local governments to keep in mind and others that if the law is actually a mandatory special law for a local government, even if the legislation doesn't put in the local approval language, they still have to file local approval under the Constitution. This is a constitutional issue, not just statutory. So the um, and it, there, there are a fair number of uh, things that have gone on where the local approval never gets filed or isn't completed, and um, I'm just sure there's at least one sewage system out there that was fully constructed, bonds were issued with the law never taking effect, and it, these things happen, and sometimes uh, there is corrective uh, legislation uh, that's made retroactive, sometimes not, but um, it's one of those things that um, as either in uh, as judges and law clerks and practitioners, it's something you want to pay attention to. Did the law actually take effect? And if not, what do you want to do about it, if anything? I have a, I took some screenshots of things to try and show what these, this is the current certificate of local approval that is available. This is, you can find this on the Secretary of State's website. Um, it's, as I said, prepared by the uh, Attorney General's office. And after a meeting this interim, uh, Last fall, we were talking about the need to modify this form to take into account that it doesn't really identify that there are special sessions, articles, and chapters. And we've seen some very odd certificates filed that sometimes I wonder, you know, what's what is going on. I was looking at local approvals from law's last session and found one where they filed it. 
but everything they cited was from some law that was enacted years ago. They just pulled something out of the file, as far as I could tell, and refiled what they'd done for some previous law. So the understanding of what it means to approve a local law isn't, necess isn't universally understood. And so we had a meeting to talk about whether or not the form could be improved to try and encourage accurate filing. Uh, that's the website for the Secretary of State's um, office. That's the location where you can find <coughs> either the certificate of local approval or um, you can also check to see if a law was approved. They've put everything on the website now and used to have to go down to the Secretary of State's office and go through some files and now it's all um, on the web. So it's a lot easier to find these things. Um, now one of my favorite parts, cautionary tales. Um, and the one that um, I like, like the least and is now more amusing than annoying is the Central Iron Range Sanitary Sewer District from 2009 and for a while people in our office were calling it the gift that just kept on giving the what happened there it there it took four tries to get this law right in 2002 um, the communities in the iron range that were involved Buell, Chisholm, Kinney, the town of Balkan, Great Scott and Hibbing were all involved in trying to put together a sanitary sewer district and they had a law enacted. It was drafted as many had been before. It was in the form of a mandatory, you, you know, this district shall be established. And then everything was mandatory after that. There were some errors in the bill. It referred to one of the town's cities as a town or vice versa. And then the um, it also had some provisions in it that they started arguing over after the bill was introduced. And it required local approval and they did not approve it. So it didn't take effect. That was in 2002, which is the last year of the biennium. The beginning of the next biennium in 2003, another bill was introduced and it was the whole thing all over again, correct, making corrections to the errors in the bill that, from before, making the changes they had agreed to. And then um, as it moved through various committees, because it had to go to several committees, at some point it was amended to take out all the provisions that were identical to what had happened in the previous biennium, the bill that had been enacted but had not taken effect. And so the 2003 law was only amending provisions that actually had never taken effect. So that one didn't work because there was no underlying law to amend. But they proceeded for a while. In 2008, it came back again. There was another correction to the 2002 law and it was to retroactively approve what had happened all the way back to 2003. Um, and this time we thought we had it all correct and everything was fine and everybody filed their local approval except one town that filed it one day late and so the law did not take effect. So 2009 was the charm. We made it permissive <laughs> and um, again it had to be changed because they were still arguing about how it should be structured and who was involved so it was substantively different but in 2009 it became permissive legislation and finally took effect and um, was retroactive to 2003. So that's one of the cautionary tales that it always astonished me how long it took us to get there. And I often try to encourage communities that are doing things to make it permissive if they can um, and encourage the authors because of these type of problems. Uh, the St. Paul Civil Service separation in 2003 um, is an example of a curative act um, let's see if I have, I don't know if I have a copy of that one here. I think that's it. Um, and you'll find a list of curative acts in uh, the Minnesota Statutes Annotated Volume 42. And uh, they are comprised of remedial legislation intended to relieve the parties of harsh consequences of failure. And that for the um, St. Paul Civil Service separation, I think the issue was that they had, it was the school district and the city had come to a gr agreement on some civil service issues and they'd been acting under that. They adopted the resolutions, they just never filed them. And so uh, this allowed that if they would file them, and I think it was almost 10 years later, uh, they could then, um, it was deemed approved. 
and let's see the uh, Cedar Lake area water sewer in 2015 is another example where there um, I can't even read my own typing but I think it was not with I can't see if it's what it says notwithstanding the time limits they miss, okay they missed the times um, if they do, if they file their local approval by a certain date, it's deemed retroactively approved. So there's that kind of correction. The, um, I think the last one I have up here, Hibbing. This is, goes back to the whole issue of special laws. As you can see, this is a 1939 law. And at that time, 1939, no, no local, gov uh, local laws, special laws prohibited under the constitution. So it was created as class legislation. It was also when we had villages and boroughs and we don't have those anymore. Um, but it talks about a village with a population of more than 10,000 um, and goes through that. When it was amended in 1982, it was like, well, let's just say who this is. And so it was amended. We amended the original um, 1939 law to just say, this is Hibbing and this is what we're doing. So it was, and it brought it more up to date. But um, I think you'll see that when you're Dealing with local government laws, especially ones that go back that far, sometimes it's hard to know what law applies to a unit of government. If the law was enacted back before 1958, it's still alive, it's still a real law, but you may not be able to easily identify what applies. Let's see where I am. Um, let's see, contiguous counties. There's a provision in the Constitution in Article 12, Section 2, um, that um, says that, that refers to contiguous counties. Um, it's laws effective upon, uh, re that relates to a single unit of government, group of such units, a single county or a number of contiguous counties is a special law and has to name them or name the counties. And um, I've noticed this in the, Revisor's Manual and um, my predecessor in local government law and house research talked about it as well, that um, you can't have a special law that applies to non-contiguous counties. I don't know that that has ever been challenged and I, um, it's one thing I kind of see and I don't know if it means within this, you know, this provision applies to this county here, here and here, or if it's within like an omnibus bill. I really don't know how this applies and I've never, heard of one being challenged. So if somebody does know of a challenge to something relating to contiguous counties, it'd be useful to know about. But um, it's one thing I kind of keep in mind when I'm looking at these uh, bills. Um, the issue of using local approval language when it's not required. Um, I talked about that, the whole problem with the Central Iron Range. You know, if you can make it permissive and there's no good reason to make it subject to local approval, in my world, it's a good reason if the legislators want it. And if they want it, they put it in. Um, but the uh, it can sometimes create problems. So it's something to think about, and it's also uh, uh, also in researching. And again, then the default effective dates of August first, unless it's a omnibus bill with uh, appropriating money, in which case it's July first, um, or unless you put in a special effective date. Other drafting issues: multiple units. Um, yeah, the effective dates for multiple. If you have a whole list of units of government that this is applying to, uh, you wanna know if it, if it becomes effective as to each unit of government as they file local approval, or if it's only if they all file it. With Central Iron Range Sanitary Sewer District, they all had to have filed it before any of it became effective. Other bills that I've drafted, um, it's effective for each one as they approve it, and if somebody doesn't, they just don't get it. Um, Another drafting thing, and this is really important in researching local government law, you have to know what you're talking about when you say city. City is defined in Minnesota statutes to mean statutory cities. It does not apply to home rule charter cities. So if you see a statute or a law that says all cities must do X, you have to figure out, is it applying to statutory cities or statutory cities and home rule charter cities? And there's, uh, so you wanna look for definitions. Um, a city actually defined for the purposes of that section. When was the section enacted? Does it predate when this law was enacted? Um, this, so it, there's always um, a little bit of concern about the use of the word city alone. Okay, uh, researching. Um, researching local laws. 
it is so much more easy now than it used to be to find local laws because the uh, re uh, all session laws back to the beginning of time have been scanned into the reviser system and you can now do keyword searches back to the 1850s um, to see if you can find a law. Uh, there is table one um, that is, I think it's 1849 to present special laws, but it is an unedited table. It was, at, I was told at one time that it was put together by law students many years ago and whether or not you find something, if you find something in there that says this is a special law, it may have been repealed for all we know. Um, or later amended. So it's there as a starting point, but it's not, and it's only in the print version. It, this is what I'm talking about is the print version, not the online tables. And then topical indexes. Uh, for the, this is a screenshot of the uh, reviser system for searching laws. So you can see that um, how you can, um, where it says Minnesota laws, there's a drop down menu that you can go back as far as you want for searching and turn searches. If you were, um, it also covers rules. And I think I have a, um, this one, uh, the session laws amended or repealed. And I think this one, I think goes back to 1949. Um, I don't think it's goes back to the beginning of time. Do you know? Okay. I think it's 49 to present, but this is also useful if you're trying to find out if a session law that applies only to a unit of government, if it was ever amended. Um, and that's important to know. So, uh, like I said, it's so much easier. It used to be go through all the tables, find all the books, pull them all out. It, this is a fabulous tool. Um, the print version, session laws, tables four, five, and an odd number of years, six. These are the list of special laws that were enacted. And there you'll find out whether or not the certificate of local approval was filed before the books went to print. Um, you still might, you still would probably want to check the Secretary of State's website for the actual certificate filing. And at the Secretary of State's uh, website, you can find the actual certificate and the resolution. They, they are PDFs that you can read to see, did they actually approve the right law? What does the resolution say? Um, but here's a, you can tell I found out how to do screenshots and now I do them, but uh, <laughs> I didn't used to know how to do a lot of this stuff. Special laws, so this is what it looks like. And it, but it's very specific to laws that say that local approval is either required or is not required. And um, there's always some discussion about whether or not the legislation should deem something to be um, in the category of not required. That's sort of prejudging whether or not something is a special law subject to local approval or not. And we've had discussions about that in, as drafters, but you can see that uh, the topics, it has the alphabetical listing of the unit of government, the chapter, um, it's the approval date, and the filing date. And then table five, it's laws enacted in the next year, and table six um, there. And then this is a screenshot of table one, 1849 to 2018 local special law acts. And this is what I meant, it's alphabetical, and you can see all, all the listings, but for any one of those, um, it could be that it's no longer effective, it could have been repealed, but it's a starting point for doing some research. And there's more resources. As I said, the drafting manual that is on the revisor's website is an excellent resource for this. Uh, there's a law review article from 1923 that's all about special legislation in Minnesota that I found very helpful in understanding what was going on. And then um, there's a law professor, she, Hamlin or Mitchell, anyway, Mary Jane Morrison wrote a, an art, uh, a guide to the Minnesota State Constitution that has some information on it. The last topics, my own time. Oh, I'm going to. Okay. The um, local government organization. Um, I listed special purposes, sub special purpose units of government last, like the Met Council, the Airports Commission, school districts, watershed districts, et cetera. I listed it last because I don't really intend to talk about it much, but I did, um, I will have some information on it first to get it out of the way. That's not the right thing, there we go. But I am gonna talk about counties, 
as administrative arms of the state, but in some areas they're also treated as general purpose units of government. Cities, which are general purpose, and towns. Um, and the difference between cities and towns, you know, you have the representative form of government, the city council for cities, and towns as limited general purpose units of government um, have the direct democracy of annual town meeting where they vote to set their own levies and certain other things, but it's a little bit different structure. Just to quickly cover special districts, uh, the enabling law may be general or special, um, and it will determine the financing that supports them. They're typically formed for a single purpose or limited purposes, uh, watershed districts, governing the watershed, school districts for schools, et cetera. The governance is going to depend on the enabling legislation, which again may be statutory or it may be in session law only. Some but typically if it's a permanent uh, type of government, it's going to show up in the statutes or the authority to set up the special district will be in statute. Uh, there's some examples. Every now and then we try to get a handle on how many special units uh, of government there are, special districts. We can figure out the special taxing districts because Department of Revenue helps with that. And in 2014, the last time I looked, there were about 230 special tax taxing districts that were levying. Uh, there are other special districts that don't levy, and there are districts that don't have levy authority. So, anyway, that's it for special districts. I'm not going to talk about them anymore. Counties, 87 counties in Minnesota. Uh, they have different organizational options. Uh, for example, the size of the county board um, and whether or not offices are appointed or elected but actions are by the county board. And then there's certain department heads who are also elected officials, your sheriff, your county attorney. Um, in some counties, it's still the treasurer, recorder, um, auditor. Basically, they have the same core powers and duties and they operate, the, the general statutes that govern county organization are four, 370 to 403. There are plenty of other places with county organizational structures and many of them have special laws. I always find it interesting, others may not, how different they can be. Because when you're talking about all counties must do this or, uh, or may do that, the sheer size difference in population uh, can really affect whether or not it's a, a good thing. You have Traverse County at the smallest, 3,316 population in Traverse County, has the same obligations from a governmental structure point of view as Hennepin County at over 1 million population. And um, it can make a real difference in uh, their capacity to provide services. Land area is only relevant at some, in some ways, but Ramsey County is the smallest at 155 square miles, and St. Louis County at 7,000. Every now and then there have been proposals to split counties. The last time a county was formed is 1922, I think it was Coochie Ching, but in 1999, Pine County was trying to split. And it was not that somebody wanted to form a new county. It was that the south, I think it was the southern part of the county that had the county seat wanted to dump the other part of the county. And that's when they discovered that the statute didn't really address that situation. And, but it went to vote. And in that year, the highest voter turnout probably in the nation was 99% voter turnout in Pine County for the general election that year. But it was because of this vote on splitting the county. and. The split failed, but that was the last one I knew about. But it was very interesting. The statute then was amended after that to address a situation where part of a county is trying to dump the other part. So, uh, let's see. For powers, uh, again, federal and state laws uh, for counties, they have ordinances, they adopt resolutions acting through the department heads and the county board. I think one of the things about uh, counties that uh, is very different from the others is that they really are the administrative arm of the state. So you have them administering the social services, the corrections, elections, property tax administration, but they also have general uh, local government powers, the same as cities do in terms of planning and zoning, creating parks and recreation. But there was an, um, an effort a few years ago to 
give counties general welfare authority and actually make them more like what I mentioned earlier, the Cooley Doctrine, to let counties have any authority they want and require the legislature to prohibit counties from doing things. And there was a lot of discussion about that a number of years ago. And uh, the bills moved along, but eventually nothing happened. But it uh, would have really dramatically changed how local governments relate to each other as well. Probably the most active area, oops, here we go, back to that one, options in county government structure. The, um, as I said, statutes allow counties to adopt different ways to be structured, whether it's the board size or whether certain offices are elected, appointed. And at this point, most counties have adopted some change to the county offices so that some elected office is actually an appointed office. Uh, there's a publication that I have on the House Research website that has a table that lists every special law. So if you're looking at county governance structure, every special law that was enacted for a county to authorize changing the county government structure, not all of them actually followed through and then changed their structure. So I tried to track some of those down, but I didn't get all of those, but I tried to get everything. Um, there are other options that have uh, never been used, but were authorized back in the 80s to create uh, the elected executive. Um, there are like five options in county government structure. And I'm sure they were, you know, well, you know, thought through and everybody said, this is a really good idea. Nobody's ever used them. Uh, it, the, la the most recent um, change was Dakota County, but they came in and got a special law, so they didn't have to follow the general law. And they created a county manager structure. But again, it was like, there's this general law that allows everything to happen, but um, apparently the process was too cumbersome and they said, we already know what we want, give us a special law. So they got that. For cities, 853 cities in the state, um, the number changes every now and then, either through annexation or uh, dissolution. Their are statutory cities, 746. They operate under state statutes and then any special laws that might relate to them. 107 home rule charter cities that are organized under their charters and other laws. Uh, and then one of the things that's uh, I find useful to keep in mind is that city boundaries can cross county lines and there are 46 cities that are in more than one county. Um, I think both Mankato and St. Cloud now are each in three counties and um, that can affect some of the services and how they relate to the county government. I think they then participate in some joint powers things when they're dealing with certain uh, multi-jurisdictional items. The, um, let's see. Next one. Nope, that wasn't the one. Where'd it go? There we go. Um, I wasn't going to go into the plan so much, but uh, for statutory cities, they have the same basic powers. They have different organizational uh, structures, and I put up three plans there in Chapter 412. I've never actually had to pay attention to those plans myself, so I can't tell you anything about them. It has to do with the or organization of the mayor versus the city council and whether or not the clerk, I don't know. And, um, but it's useful to know there are different plans because depending on what work you're doing, that may matter. And um, then I put up their dependent cities just because I think it's one of the odd things that's still out there, but um, it probably won't matter to anybody. Dependent cities um, are an oddity. I think there are only seven left now, but um, since 1949, First of all, the thing to understand is that uh, before 1973, we used to have villages and boroughs in Minnesota. There was a major restructuring of municipal government to eliminate villages and boroughs, and they all became statutory cities, um, and some may have been changed to home rule charter, uh, but the transition then eliminated the term village and borough. So you'll see those terms in old statutes, but not uh, currently. But one of the things about villages is that uh, when they were established, they weren't necessarily separated from towns for purposes of taxation, I think, but primarily election. So let's see, how did it work? The four, I got this information from the League of Minnesota Cities um, information, but if you're not separated, if a city and a town are not separated, the town assessor is also responsible for assessing property in the city. The city has no assessor of its own. 
the town levies taxes for general town purposes against property in the city. So you have the town levying in the city in a city that's not separated. The city does not constitute a separate election district. Town officials still administer the elections so that while town voters living outside city limits can't vote in city matters or hold city offices, city residents may vote at the town meeting. Right now, um, over time, um, they've officially separated and there are procedures in statute for separation, both they can be initiated by the town or by the city. Since 1949, you can't create that situation anymore. But uh, so the ones that are left were um, from before 1949, but Big Stone County has uh, some, and uh, let's see what, so there's Big Stone County and Itasca County and St. Louis County are uh, the seven locations where there's still unseparated uh, cities and towns or also known as dependent cities. So again, in terms of those who might be practicing, it might be useful to know about that. Home rule charter cities, uh, 107 of them, as I mentioned, it's essentially a little a local constitution and any city can go through the procedures and statute um, it's in chapter 410 of Minnesota statutes to adopt the uh, it's a process of having a ju judge set up a charter commission and then putting together the charter that it has to be adopted by a vote there are procedures for amending charters um, and for abolishing the charter commission um, after, if a vote has failed there's more discretion and local control because essentially the Home Rule Charter can allow a city to exercise any power that it gives itself as long as it's not in conflict with the state, uh, with state law and statutory or the constitution. And there are some differences um, that are between the charters, but they often uh, set up very similar uh, structures. There's uh, good advice on the League of Minnesota Cities website for what might go into a charter and how to go through the procedures for it. And there's also information about the pros and cons of having a charter. Uh, one of, a charter can allow a local government, as I think I mentioned before, have initiative and referendum. Statutory cities don't have that. There can be a provision for recall of elected officials. There's some uh, judicial limitations on what that, can, how far that can go, but statutory cities don't have that at all, so. Um, Oh, did I already change it? Oh, okay, there we go. Um, for all cities, again, the state and federal laws, ordinances and charters, ordinances vary, they have to be the council, not the individual. Oh, okay, that's fine. Um, population. Um, so you have the total state population right now is at the estimates at about 5,600,000. And these get distributed through various classifications of cities and towns. And I always like to see how this kind of shakes out. So I have a chart that shows the first class cities. There are four of them, uh, Rochester, Duluth, St. Paul, and Minneapolis. If you look at the second class cities with the population between, um, what was that, 20,000 and 100,000. And that's where you have a, um, a significant portion of the state. and uh, but it's 51 cities there. And then you have the third class cities, not so many, fourth class, and then towns, 1,781 towns with only 17% of the state's population. And then there's this thing called unorganized areas in 16 counties, 39 or 38,000 population roughly. Um, unorganized, this gets back to what is a town and what is a township and I find the terms to be used inconsistently in statute. In theory, a town is the organized town that has the town board of supervisors. I think I get into this in a second. Yeah, I do. The next slide. Here we go. Towns. Um, if it's organized, you have a town board of supervisors, typically three or five uh, uh, supervisors. Um, if it's the unorganized township, you're talking about the original uh, congressional townships, which are a ge geographic area of six miles by six miles, 36 square miles that um, are mapped out. They do not cross 
county lines. Uh, but in statute, I find the term town or township used inconsistently. If you're in just the statutes 365 through 368A, it's pretty much town, meaning the organized town with a town board of supervisors. But then I was looking at the local government. Where'd that talk? Why did it change? Okay. It does change on its own. Um, in the local government aid statute, the term township is, seems to be the term used. So um, I don't know what to tell you. Uh, it's just used inconsistently. So I, again, the main thing is always look for definitions wherever you're working in any statute. Municipality might be defined by to mean only a city, or like the tort liability statute, it might mean everything, including some nonprofits. And so you have to be careful. Towns again. Um, there we go. Urban towns. They have some more powers uh, that are more similar to cities, but they're not. They don't have all the powers of a city. Um, the statute says who can become an urban town. We don't know who they are because they decide whether or not they're going to be an urban town if they meet the criteria, but I don't have a list of who's an urban town and who isn't. And oh, I came in pretty close. Okay, that was it. Um, I list resources. Uh, the, legis the last one at the bottom, the legislative reference library has a link to the world site and the local government link can get you to all of these and they maintain the links so that they're up to date, which I always like to find links that stay left up to date. And so, and then each of the local government associations. Um, so that's all I had for today. And are there any questions? Anybody write anything in? Nobody's written in any questions. Okay. So that's all I've got for you.